I work for uh, Polydia. This is a software house uh, situated in uh, Warsaw. And uh, I've come uh, here to give you a talk about uh, how hard it is it was to uh, to build an uh, Rx uh, library. Uh, well, I will share this uh, information from three points of view: the users, the developers, and the potential uh, maintainers of the of the library. Uh, maintainers or contr external contributors. Uh, now, a question: Did uh, is here anyone who did not encounter Rx Java or any reactive uh, library before? Uh, yeah, I see one hand. No, I, I'm not sure. Really sure? Okay, all right. So I will skip. Uh, yep. Uh, a second. So I will skip uh, the introduction to uh, Rx Java. I will just uh, emphasize one thing that I think that uh, is the most important part of uh, reactive uh, programming. Uh, when we have an observable that is emitting an item, for instance, if we are having uh, a production line of, of bottles, and a single bottle is uh, being established, uh, is being uh, produced, uh, then we can apply a function on it. For instance, make it red. And from that point of view, usually the user is not interested in the original observable that uh, he started with, but only with uh, the observable that is already transformed with a function. So. He skips the production line, he just wants to have a red bottle. And on that red bottle, uh, he can again apply next functional transformation, for instance, fill it with water. And again, after filling with water, he's not interested really in how he uh, came to the point when, when he has uh, a production line that uh, is producing uh, bottles that are red and that are filled with water. Uh, it's, it's a straight functional, uh, straight si functional situation on which it is easy to define what is the input of a function and what is the output of a, of a function. And having a strictly functional uh, code uh, gives you a lot better handling of uh, potential problems that may arise during the, the execution. Uh, all right, so uh, in 2000, to give you a bit of a background uh, of what uh, I was doing uh, past one and a half year, uh, in 2010, uh, Bluetooth Signature Group uh, has incorporated uh, a new standard to the specification of Bluetooth. Uh, namely Bluetooth Smart or Bluetooth 4.0, Bluetooth Low Energy. These are the names. And uh, this is a quite new standard for uh, radio communication, uh, ra radio communication with uh, low energy devices. It is aimed for low energy communication between usually smartphones and IoT devices. And the thing is that uh, this uh, whole specification is quite large. It has more than 4,000 uh, pages, and uh, it's not that easy to get right. If you would uh, put in uh, Google BLE issues, you would get probably tens of millions of results uh, for that for that query. Um, yeah, to, to give you a big, uh, a bit more introduction to that, uh, as it is a wireless communication. Uh, it is involving a radio, a radio adapter that is uh, an entry point for all other interactions, namely for discovering the devices that are nearby or for connecting or communication, communicating with uh, a particular device. And uh, yeah, when, when discovering a device, there is of course uh, a, um, a device that is uh, in question. And this device is uh, 
described with a uh, GAT uh, generic attribute uh, profile named GAT. This generic attribute profile has basically uh, all of the attributes that are used, that are possible to, to alter on a device. It uh, consists of uh, services. The services uh, are basically the functionality that a particular device or a GAT profile offers to the user, to the client. Uh, for instance, a service could be uh, a heart rate monitor or a weight or a cadence uh, um, monitor for, uh, for cyclists. Uh, every service contains uh, many characteristics, uh, may contain many characteristics, which are basically uh, the entry points for, uh, for all of the communication. And the characteristics are the kind of a buffers that you can put write uh, information on to, uh, to read uh, information from, or to set a notification uh, in two ways, that uh, a particular device will give you a proactive notification when a value on a, of a specific characteristic uh, will will change, and there are many many uh, other uh, There are many many other attributes. Uh, there are also descriptors for uh, characteristics. Uh, the descriptors are basically uh, describing what uh, a particular characteristic does. This is not uh, really important. The thing is that uh, this uh, these all attributes uh, are quite uh, cumbersome to use when dealing with uh, the native uh, Android uh, API. Uh, just to give you a few uh, examples, when dealing with a radio adapter, you before you can use it successfully, you need to check three states. First, if you have uh, the permission uh, for using the Bluetooth, quite obvious. Uh, secondly, you need to have a permission for locating a user because this is not so obvious, but having a Bluetooth uh, beacons which are, which position are um, is known, you are able to track the user's location. But even then, to use Bluetooth and uh, scan the devices uh, that are nearby, you still need to uh, start a GPS uh, location, or you will get no results without any error. So this is uh, this is. Uh, this is how it works, but it doesn't follow the functional paradigm because there are many uh, places, outputs that you would need to chain, check to, to get the actual state that you are in. Uh, there are more situations like that. For instance, when dealing with uh, characteristic reads or writes, uh, you can have a situation that uh, particular permission will be revoked or a uh, Bluetooth adapter will be turned off. And when dealing with only a characteristic, you will have no information why there is a timeout. Or you will even get no timeout because some state in a different place uh, of the API has changed. And there are more situations like that. Reading a characteristic, but the connection was being dropped. Again, no information on the characteristic about it. Uh, this this is something that uh, usually was the main uh, culprit for applications on Android that were not getting high uh, ra ratings because errors on the communication level. All right, so when dealing with a new Eric's library or uh, writing one, the very important part of the process is to define the abstraction. Because as you may imagine, the Bluetooth specification is quite good. Like, uh, it's very solid, though it's very large and uh, like generic attributes profile. It is not something that uh, people tend to have experience with. And uh, maybe there is something that, uh, some, some way of describing it that will help 
uh, in successful understanding of what is going on and how to how to work with it. So I've started uh, building the library in 2015, and it was not the first. Uh, uh, it was not the first attempt that I've uh, uh, taken upon that uh, was good enough. When there are many uh, layers of the protocol, the Bluetooth adapter, the Bluetooth device, and the GAT, uh, usually when people are trying to write a new Eric's library, they're just wrapping the interface that is already there. So that was what I, what I did. And yeah, there were Bluetooth client, Bluetooth device, Bluetooth GAT. I was able to squeeze some more information, make the API more functional, but still I would get a Bluetooth GAT packaged, wrapped, but still it can be in different states. It can be connected, disconnected. I would need to connect or disconnect it. This is something that needs to be managed by, by the user. And the more uh, states that the uh, user needs to manage, the more likely, the more prone is the application to, to have a bug. So the other uh, problem was that uh, having this abstraction was uh, not really meant to, to fit into an actual implementation that uh, would work flawlessly. I have spent around three weeks playing with a prototype with that and it was no go. So I fiddled uh, a bit with, uh, with the thought that, okay, I need to connect the GAT and disconnect it. So maybe, maybe the GAT isn't that really important. Maybe a different abstraction will be better. I have come, came with Bluetooth connection. And that is something that s feels better. So still, is the connection connected or disconnected? On w uh, I would need to connect the device to get the connection. A bit better, but still not, uh, not best. And after a while, I thought that, hey, maybe a user is not really interested in how to connect. Maybe they just want to get connection at some point. And just to establish a connection. And the connection itself stopped to be uh, something that uh, is always there. Like The connection is only uh, a result of uh, an emission of calling Eric's BD, the uh, Eric's BLE device established connection. In this situation, this is purely functional approach which doesn't does not have any side effects. Yes, call the function and get uh, the connection. And uh, the thoughts that uh, came after were, were that uh, simple wrapping is uh, usually not enough for uh, Eric's uh, libraries. That's the, you, you can do better. And sometimes you need to mm, propose something completely different from the abstraction that is already there. Uh, you need to experiment a bit to, to find uh, what, what works best. And you should aim for most stateless functional interaction. Because what is going on is that the state is, is hard. State is the main culprit for the bugs that can, uh, that can happen. Um, a great uh, example of a stateless interface is a HTTP connection. It can be imagined as a tunnel. It has only an input, an entrance, and an output. It has no state, just you can safely open several HTTP connections and you, you can be sure that they will not, will not interact with themselves. There will be clear separation of concerns. So when we have our abstraction, we should go to, to define the API. And when I have started uh, working with, uh, with the library, uh, there was only an Eric's Java in version 1.1.0. And the only uh, possible interface to use was an observable. So 
here is a part of the interface of the connection from that uh, time. You could read a characteristic, write one, set up a notification, read descriptor, or write descriptor. What you can see here is that there are observables, basically everywhere. And apparently, some of you with uh, good eyes can even see that there is an observable that emits observables. But sometimes this, uh, this abstraction works. Uh, usually, uh, users were quite confused when uh, finding this interface. Uh, how many of you tried a new library strictly by uh, looking on the API? Okay, I think that the rest of you uh, first look on the specification or the documentation of the library. All right, that's what I thought. Uh, so the uh, users that uh, were using the library asked for, like, hey, could you specify a bit better what is going on when I have a specific uh, observable returned? Well, yeah, I did this uh, table, but again, the user would need to find it, and it was on the readme. Uh, not really ideal situation when people come. I need to dig through the documentation to find what, what, is, what uh, they will get. So, uh, currently the Eric's uh, Java or all others uh, reactive uh, libraries have matured and there are more uh, other interfaces that we can use. Observables, singles, completables and maybes. Well, these are all just special situations for observables. Single just emits one value or, uh, uh, or emits an error. A completable just completes or emits an error. And maybe, well, maybe will emit or maybe not. Even then, uh, when we see this, that we have more uh, possibilities, it's good to play with them. So the old API would become the new API. A whole lot easier to understand only by looking on the API, only by playing with a, with a library. This, this one change has an uh, impact on both users that will uh, spend less time getting into the speed, to getting to the knowledge of, uh, of a particular library, plus it will save the time of the developer uh, adding new documentation somewhere. Okay, so we have uh, our API, but we firstly introduced one of, of the one interface, and then it turned out that it does not really work that well, and we should introduce another one. Uh, the thing is that uh, users, uh, when once made the, their code work, will not want to revisit the same uh, part and uh, to add uh, uh, to change their code to to use the new API. Uh, and uh, for the users to know where they can. Um, when, when they can uh, safely update uh, a library without the need uh, of uh, touching the code. Uh, there's a well-established uh, way of doing that in the interest industry. It is semantic versioning. Like for uh, when I have started, I didn't really pay attention for that. And sometimes I had situation when I have updated libraries that were only patched, and I needed to change the API. Not really convenient. Okay, so what can we do with the semantic versioning? Uh, semantic versioning uh, is, uh, consists of three parts. The major version, minor version, and the patch version. On the patch version, only, in, uh, only implementation changes are allowed. Nothing in the API should change. On the minor version, we can uh, make ABI changes. What is the ABI? 
I have learned only recently. Uh, and the ABI stands for Application Binary Interface. Uh, this is basically an API for your compiler. When we type the words in an IDE, we, we type with the API. When the compiler starts the work, they transform the API call to the ABI, where a particular address uh, of the file is used to execute uh, uh, code. Uh, the same goes uh, for uh, changing the signatures of functions, methods, or interfaces, uh, public interfaces. Uh, even changing the call from a variable of a parameter that comes to a function to a varg parameters changes the ABI. Okay, and on the major, you can basically change all of the API, uh, remove the old one, whatever you you want. The thing is that users do not like to to uh, to li uh, do not like when the library changes majors too often. So, unfortunately, if you have introduced uh, an interface uh, at one point, you would, you should support it for at least some time. Uh, but we can do something with that. The, the thing is that we should think about it before we release uh, a new interface. Uh, we should ask ourselves what should be exposed in the public API. How to expose a smaller surface of the API. Will it possible to translate one API to another seamlessly under the interface? So the user would not know that something has changed under the interface. And uh, in the industry, we often uh, hear that uh, it's, it is possible to uh, start an application from the minimum viable product. The same goes for the libraries. Uh, when you start with only small amount of effort, but you will be able to um, to secure use cases of uh, a majority of, of the users. All right, so then we are coming to the phase three. We have our good abstraction, a small surface, but again, for our green pastures, there will come a user and will say, all right, but I need to change something, something uh, in how your API works. I would like you to add me a parameter in the interface. I, I want you to add me some knobs. Okay, so what options do we have? We could basically expose all of the knobs in the interface. And having an interface that is easy to, to work with uh, for the novice uh, users will have no parameters. But then, for instance, we can have two different parameters that will alter some in some way how the API behaves. Okay, but what if the user would like to change all of them? In this situation, we would have four different uh, methods calls that would do basically the same. Okay, but what, what if we would get uh, another parameter there? The number of methods will exponentially grow and we would need to support it, the, uh, the interface will get bloated, and uh, when the new user will come to your library and will try to uh, use it only by looking on the API, they will get a bit confused. But this is a valid approach, some libraries use it. For instance, the Eric's Java, when you will come to the API, you will see that it has, I don't know, some, somewhere around 100 functions. And so, yeah, it, it's possible to, to use it. And the other option is to use a telescopic uh, constructor pattern. Uh, used uh, mostly in the constructor pattern of, uh, of uh, classes in Java. But uh, it's easy. We have only one method that is doing actually something. And then we have other methods that are just 
telesc uh, like a telescope that are enhancing the same call with uh, different uh, parameters. Okay, and uh, there are more than there are even more patterns. What uh, apparently worked best for the uh, Bluetooth uh, communication was a strategy builder pattern. So we would have a simple method that would be suitable for most of the users and uh, a version that would use a strategy. And a strategy would uh, contain the default uh, values for, uh, for the calls. Having a builder with that may uh, gives the user ability to learn the uh, the usage of the library only by using the API because they will see that they need some strategy. The some strategy would have a builder, and builder would have only the methods that are relevant to to this particular call. So, having uh, there there is no sil silver bullet for that. But having to know what options do you have, you can think in front about what is the ideal solution. Because then you will, again, save the amount of time that the user takes to, to use your API and the amount of time that you will lose for uh, supporting them. All right. So even then, this is not all. Uh, sometimes. The API will just inform the user how some functionality is working. But functionality is not all. Sometimes there is more than that. This is called domain logic or domain knowledge. This is something that uh, you cannot learn only by looking on the API of a library. For instance, in Bluetooth communication, it is uh, it is the state that you need to manage. And uh, you need to call the native API in a particular way. To, is it, uh, to make it easy for, uh, for the users, you, would, uh, you can um, take one of two strategies. Uh, apparently, when dealing with uh, actions on the Bluetooth radio, the radio can only execute one action at any given moment. But it's quite easy to implement a queue for just for them. And they will have no information about how it is executed. If they are uh, interested only in executing uh, an action, it will happen at some point in time. The rest is handled for them. Uh, but uh, it's not always the case. When a user would try to establish a connection to a device, they will establish it at some point in time. But some people do not know that uh, Bluetooth specification says that only one connection can, uh, can be established to a given device at any given moment. So if they will try to uh, establish a second connection, what, would, uh, what should happen then? We could, again, say that, hey, we have already a connection opened. So here you go. And they will try to use it. The problem is that this connection Usually, in Bluetooth communication, there is a re uh, request response model being used. The thing is that the re request response model is stateful. It is a res response for a given request. When trying to execute two requests at the given moment, it is possible that the responses will get mixed. And this may lead to, uh, to hard to debug problems with the code uh, of the user. Okay, so what can we do? We can also try to uh, postpone the establish of the second connection, establishment of the second connection, until the first one will finish. And this is a valid approach, but still, users will get uh, distracted because uh, their connection will not be established for an unknown amount of time. It's it will only be established when the first connection. Will get uh, would get closed by any reason, an error or just disconnected. Uh, so in this situation, the best idea is to inform the uh, user proactively that something is doing wrong and 
to give him uh, a exception that hey you have already uh, established a connection and then they can follow the code where the connection uh, was being established and then it's easy to use Eric's Java to share the uh, connection just by calling the share operator but informing the user that s they are trying to do something that is not supported and is not supposed to be done is really important it's really important to give them meaningful feedback um, so if your library is uh, encountering an error uh, that is happening somewhere below is quite important if you know what is going on to wrap it up and give a good explanation and preferably a link to the knowledge when, where the user can uh, establish the, their knowledge about a particular topic. Uh, in my case it was uh, something uh, called a gut status error. When, uh, when connecting to a device, a lot of different errors may, may happen. And one of them, it was uh, the gut error that just showed a uh, particular integer value. And it was hard to, to find the reason because it was not documented on the Java API. Later on, I have stumbled upon uh, in the Android source files a header file for a C, uh, a header of a C file, and found out that every single uh, error is, descript uh, is uh, described there. So I thought that hey, maybe this will this will help. And suddenly, after deploying this little change, when printing the exception, a lot less people came to me to, to ask what is the problem. And this will save your time and, again, the time of your users. Okay, but educating your users is the not only thing. Because usually when you are trying to uh, build something, this is not necessarily a library and not an Eric's library, maybe some module that not only you will use, uh, but uh, also uh, people that will come after you to, to, to your work. And sometimes you will have, you will see in the code that, all right, we have some class that is verifying scan preconditions. Okay, it's for AP24. And it uses the same class, but only for the API 18. Fair enough. And there is another call that is checking if it was not called too many times. And when a new contributor or a new maintainer comes to your code, it is no difference for them if that will be checking a specific uh, parameter of, of the code. It is just a magic number. They have no idea why it, why it has uh, it has been put in this, uh, this place, at the first place. So, we all should aim for self-descripting code. So, to get the reasoning about what is going on as easy as possible to, to f the future you or the maintainers or, s or contributors that will come. But there, there is nothing I could think of that would uh, get around just giving a plain old-fashioned comment in the code why something was being put in a place. A good idea is also to, to put a link to a place where uh, more knowledge is being stored. All right, so who of you have ever uh, uh, put a commit message like this? Revated behavior changes or fixed a bug in. Okay, what, what do you know about it? Okay, it will fix a bug. But what, what bug? Why did it happen? Where, do, where, where was it introduced? Well, you do not really know. This is a bad solution. A bit better solution is to give at least a link to the information where more knowledge can be found. It is a reference to an issue somewhere. But 
Okay, it's better. Still, the information there, the link may be inactive, or the person who is looking at it may not have access uh, to a particular site. So there is uh, something uh, in the SVN applications that, uh, uh, that allows you, uh, that makes the application uh, treat the first line of the commit a bit differently than the rest. So here, uh, the first, first 60 characters or the first line uh, would be always shown as a title. But still, the commit message may be arbitrarily long. And you, you will not see it until you will come into the details of, uh, of a specific commit. And there, you can have uh, a full uh, backlog of the information that you need to understand what has changed, why has changed, and because uh, people could have only reason about your log, uh, about your code, by checking, uh, by blaming the, the uh, blaming the repository and checking what has happened on which commit, this turned out to be really, uh, really helpful for the maintainers and for future me because after half of a year, I do not remember what I have done in the library. And last but not least, tests. Tests are extremely important, especially in any long-running uh, project. Without the tests, it beat me hard many times that uh, I did not start the tests as soon as possible. The tests are the safety net, your only safety net be be uh, before regression and for all your maintainers that will come after you and they will have not the same domain logic, domain knowledge that you have. This is uh, an ideal solution is if you find a bug, you always first thing that you do, you put a new test for that particular bug. And only then you start to uh, start to fix in it. All right, so to wrap things up, from my experience, which I've gathered during uh, one and a half year of developing uh, the library, it turned out that there are some parts that are really uh, important to do at first. So try to model your API in the most natural way of the interaction, because people will, will not try to Usually, people will not try to first use your documentation to learn about the topic they, they are going to touch. Secondly, aim for stateless interactions, because this, is, this gives you the power to, um, to model the interactions, the data flow, only in one place, and uh, it's then really easy to, to track a bug and try to uh, avoid it. Moreover, when designing the API, it's good to think about the size API prior before building it. And think about the usage, uh, simplicity of the usage. Uh, if it will be possible to at least learn the API only by checking the header files. and Think, that, think as well, think about the potential enhancement points in the code. And last things is to do not make the access to the uh, domain knowledge harder for both you, you, your future you, your users, and the maintainers. Uh, always leave as, ma as many breadcrumbs to the domain logic as possible, because then it is a way easy, easier to, to find what the, the change or what is the reasoning be, uh, behind some decisions in the code. Test as much as possible and as soon as possible. And also pick your battles to know where, where it is uh, the best solution to manage problems for your users and for you and when it is best just to tell 
that something went wrong and what went wrong. All right, thank you very much. And do you have questions? So my question is because this library is open source library, right? And uh, people say that just uh, put it uh, as open source that, so that community will help you develop the library. And my question is, are there any committers from community? Is someone helping you with this library or is it open source and you are doing the whole work? Well, yeah, it is open sourced uh, and uh, there are contributors that come and try to, to help. Usually when they have something that they would like to have in the library but they do not find it before there were three or four of them that uh, actually helped in the development but there are a lot of people who have found uh, some kind of inconsistency uh, in the documentation or uh, some other minor problems uh, in the code that didn't really need it to, to understand the whole to, to help there are about 20 different contributors by, by this moment. Any other questions? Uh, do you have any competitors on the market? I mean, other open source libraries that are the same as yours? Uh, there are. Uh, the question was, uh, are, uh, are there any competitors to, the, to, the, to my library? And the answer is uh, yes and no. Basically, uh, there are uh, libraries that also uh, touch the Bluetooth, but uh, usually it's not the uh, Bluetooth low energy. There is an RX Android uh, library that uh, touches only uh, RX Bluetooth library that touches only the Bluetooth communication, and there are other libraries that uh, touch uh, Bluetooth low energy, but they are not reactive. Uh, and uh, from what I have seen up till now. Uh, my like the library that I have uh, started to develop is the most recognized one. Questions? Okay, so in this situation, thank you very much. Uh,